You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanderson, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Bryn Turnbull on the show with me today. She has an amazing new book. It's called The Woman Before Wallace, a novel of Windsor's, Vanderbilt's, and Royal Scandal. Uh, and we all love a good scandal, don't we? Uh, welcome to the show, Bryn. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited to have you. Uh, Bryn, before we get started, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, my God. You know what? This is going to sound so cheesy, but my first memory of wanting to be a storyteller was pretty much when I learned how to read. Um, I remember my grandmother taught me how to read. She taught me with this very old school, like Dick and Jane primer, and it was the summer before grade one. And I had it in my head that everybody who went into grade one would already know how to read. And I didn't <laughs> want to be. Behind. So I made her teach me throughout that summer and I just picked it up. I was like a duck to water. And I remember saying to her, well, so, did someone like do this? Is this a, like, is this a job? And she goes, yeah, people, people write, you can write stories. And from that moment, it was like, that's what I wanted to do. I didn't ever think I could. I, you know, it seemed like such a moonshot to me to actually be able to write something and have it published. I always just thought it was going to be something I do for myself. And then when I came across telling this story, it just, you know, it happened to be the right time. The stars aligned in a really beautiful way. I love that. Um, was there ever an adult, uh, maybe a parent or a teacher who kind of recognized this desire in you and, you know, offered any sort of encouragement or anything? Uh, my parents have been unbelievably supportive throughout this whole thing. Um, my mom always says that, you know, when I was young, my, my siblings, you know, they do sort of like the little books in elementary school and you write the story and you draw the picture. And she said, I kept the special ones of your brothers and sisters and I, I kept every one that you ever did. And so they always knew that this was what I was going to do. They knew it before I did really. Um, like I said, I didn't think it was an actual viable career option for me. So I went through university for English literature. And when I finished, my parents said, you should go, you should, you know, do a master's in, in creative writing. You should learn how to do it professionally. And I said, there's no way that's actually going to happen. So I, I went and I got, um, uh, you know, I went into a career in communications. And during that time, when I started working, I got the idea for The Woman Before Wallace. And when I went to my parents and I said, I want to do this, I want to go back to school and, you know, really make a go of it. They said, what took you so long to figure that one out? We, <laughs> we called this from way back. So I've been so lucky to have just such supportive people in my life have been uh, cheering me on from the beginning. I love that story so much. I, I'd like to ask people um, about the the support people around them, because, you know, when we think about writers, um, we think about someone who spends a lot of time by herself or by himself in a in a room in an office with a, a laptop or a notebook or whatever your medium is. And you're just all by yourself. Uh, and, you know, to make it through a novel um, it is a daunting process that that takes months and months for lots of people. And there, there are all sorts of points along that way to get discouraged. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's a lot of times those early uh, encouragements that we lean back on and, and that, you know, that when someone – offers that encouragement to you. It seems like such a small thing then, but it's, it really is something that we hold on to. That's, uh, that's so, so true. And it's been amazing 
you know, when you tell somebody that you're writing a novel, as you said, it's a very solitary thing. It's very, and and it's, it's like saying, you know, I want to become an astronaut or something. It doesn't feel (laughs) like it doesn't feel attainable. And so when you tell people I'm right, I'm a writer, I want to be a writer, I want to do it you almost expect them to kind of be like, oh yeah, she wants to be a writer. Like, good for her. You're not going to like, you know, you, 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 you almost like expect them not to really believe you. But the incredible thing about writing this book is every single person who I said, I'm writing a book, every single one of them was like, of course you can do it. Of course right. you can. And that That's level nice. of like that level of support is just something I never expected. And it's so humbling to know, you know, like to realize that you've got this group of people behind you or who are all lifting you up. It's, it's really, really wonderful. That's amazing. Uh, Bryn, did, did Neil Gaiman send you to the hospital when you were 11 years old? <laughs> uh, yes, he did. He did. Um, so we've got this family cottage in the Great Lakes that was built like a hundred years ago. And when my parents bought it, it was like absolutely run down. So from the time I could hold a hammer or a paintbrush. They had me holding the hammer or the paintbrush and kind of helping to fix the cottage up bit by bit. My brother and sister and I all, um, you know, pitched in from the time we could. And it used to have these old single pane, rattly, rattly windows. And I'm something of a, um, I call myself a full contact reader, meaning like if I'm sitting and reading, (laughs) I'll like navigate my way upside down in the chair. Um, I'll read while cutting vegetables. I once, I remember I got yelled at by my parents because their friends saw me reading a book while walking home from school, like across a street, across a crossing. I was told never to do that again. But so this one time we were at the cottage, I'm in my bedroom and I was lying on the bed and I was walking my feet up the window just because, you know, that's a completely normal people thing do. (laughs) Oh yeah. And I hit a fault in the window, in the single pane window, and my foot went shooting through. And I was reading Sandman at the time, um, like Neil Gaiman's graphic. I've, I've always loved graphic novels and Sandman is just unbelievable. I was probably a little too young to be reading it, but I did. <laughs> and yeah, I, like my foot went through the window and I ended up having to go to the hospital. I got stitches. Um, they super glued part of the, my foot back together. Didn't realize that that was what super glue was invented for until the doctor told me. But um, yeah, I have Neil Gaiman to thank for the very big scar on my left foot. We'll have to tag Neil in this episode and, and see what he thinks about that story. I think that's an amazing story. Um, I feel I feel like used to that. <laughs> yeah. You so you were obviously a bookish kid. Um, do you remember what the first book, maybe that not sent you to the hospital, but the first book that let you know that you could completely transport to a different time and a different place and make you feel like you were part of the story? I do remember that. Um, it was Kit Pearson's "The Sky Is Falling," and it was about two British, like uh, this British brother and sister, who get sent to Canada during the second world war to billet with a family away from, um, you know, away from the UK, away from where the bombs were falling. And that book, it like, it's, I still get shivers thinking about it today. It was such an incredible book. And as a kid reading this, you just absolutely were transported to the time and the place. And I remember thinking, okay, yeah, this is, this is a magic power for sure. So when you, um, when you first started thinking about writing and everyone told you, my goodness, what took you so long, Bryn? Um, what was, what was that first? Well, for, let me, let me back up. Let me back up. Um, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Toronto, Ontario. Okay. Toronto, Ontario. What was your first fascination with the Royal family? Because this book, uh, takes us pretty deep and, uh, and pretty ingrained in this other world uh, as an American, uh, myself, um, I'm, uh, there's a, there's a certain fascination in the States with the Royal family and with this kind of, um, old idea, um, that we don't experience in the States. And I think Canada is kind of a hybrid between those two. Um, what was, what was your early fascination with the Royal family? 
Well, you know, I think that's a very fair thing to say um, because, you know, being Canadian, there are royal family. Uh, right. You know, the queen's the queen. And, and so I've always, you know, but, I've but always she's been the back. queen over there. Yeah. 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 Right. It, queen, it's, it's not yeah. close. It's, she's it's not, not in present. close proximity. Right. Right. Yeah, she's not present in in Canada, really. You know, she's such a figurehead, but there is still this. I I don't even know, like this genteel deference that I think a lot of Canadians have, where it's like, well, we don't actually expect any intervention, but like, you know, when Prince Charles and Camilla come come over, then great, we're you know excited to see you. Um, but yeah, I'd say like, I've always been fascinated by the royal family. You know, I went through a Tudor period where I read absolutely everything I could about the Tudors, the Stuart period, everything I could read about the Stuarts. And I think one of the reasons why I find it so fascinating is it's, it's kind of like one of the most enduring soap operas that we have, right? It's, <laughs> right. you know, it's long dynasties, it's storylines, and it's recurring storylines. You know, you've got, um, you know, uh, the Duke and Dush Duchess of Sussex there's sort of, you know, there's the parallel to Edward and Wallace. And, you know, you, you find those parallels, those historical parallels back through that family line, um, you know, or not really family line, but through that lineage. And I just find that so fascinating to know that there's all of this history wrapped up in this one group, this one line of people. So, um, when you first started getting the idea for this book, what what was what came to you first? Was it just this idea of of Wallace and uh, and the the king, uh, the prince at the time? Um, was it um, uh, was it discovering uh, Telma? What what was it that intrigued you first? So I had known Edward and Wallace's story. I mean, I think you know everybody. So many people know Edward and Wallace, and they know that it's considered like the one of the greatest love stories of all time. And, you know, I'd read about them. I'd read Anne Saba's biography, like her incredible biography of Wallace Simpson. I'd read all of this stuff about them, but it, it was never my story. I never looked at their story and said, that's mine. Um, I actually have Madonna to thank for finding Telma's story. She directed a movie in 2011 called W.E., which is about Wallace and Edward and um, about that relationship that they have. And she referenced the moment uh, that kicks off my novel, which is when Wallace Simpson and Telma Furness go out for lunch at the Ritz Hotel uh, right before Telma's about to go on a, on a trip to the United States and says, Edward's going to be very lonely without me. Will you look after him while I'm gone? And Wallace reaches across the table and, you know, says, of course I will, darling. And and so that moment got referenced in this movie. And I just remember thinking, what a strange request. What a strange thing to ask of someone. And that kind of took me down the Wikipedia rabbit hole, which resulted in um, <laughs> in me figuring out that here was this incredible woman who was at the center of not only um, the events that kicked off the abdication crisis, but also um, central to one of the biggest custody battles in American history. And I realized like no one had written her story just on its own merits. So uh, I was really, really lucky to to be the person who got to write that. What's interesting to me and, and I've always found fascinating was this this idea of uh, Edward and, and Wallace um, kind of played out uh, before an international audience on, on an international stage. Now, now, this was slightly before television, but there were plenty of newsreels and, um, you know, lots of people went to the movie theater and got their news that way um, with these newsreels that would play before. And they were. And this situation and the the whole abdication and all of that really played out in front of a worldwide audience. Maybe for the first time, uh, a, a scandal like this happened on this large uh, scale. Um, as you started digging into them and then the royal family by extension and all of the pomp and circumstance that surround them, could um, could a um, um, could a situation like this have happened any time uh, in the past before the 20th century? Was this was this solely a, a 20th century kind of thing because of the the large audience and all that? W would this have been something in the past that would have just been swept away and 
and Edward would have continued on. Do you have any feelings on that? I do. Um, I think it's very much a 20th century story and a 20th century phenomenon. Um, in the generations past, you know, I, I, think, I think what's happened is the media has opened a door on the royal family that wasn't there before. And the royal family is bound up in this mysticism, in this, um, you know, in this removal from regular society. And with the advent of um, television in particular, uh, newsreels, but also journalism in general, um, that curtain's gotten drawn back. And I think with um, Edward and Wallace Simpson, that was the first time that that curtain really got drawn back on the royal family. And people were able to see that, no, these are, you know, these are fallible individuals. These are, these are people, they're not symbols. Um, you know, you contrast that to, say, Henry VIII and his, right. you know, revolving door of wives. People <laughs> wouldn't have seen that, you know, regular people wouldn't really realize that was happening. And if they did, he was able to say, well, I'm the head of the Church of England. So, you know, I'm going to say it's good. I'm, I'm going to say it's good. So right. I, I think that I think that with the media, people have been able to puncture that um, that ethos, that myth around them in a really um, impactful way. And I will say, you know, while or Thelma dealt with that same thing with the with the Gloria Vanderbilt trial, that was the first modern celebrity trial that we see where people were like frenzied about it. They were reporting on this story as far away as Pakistan. Um, and, you know, it, like I just see the parallels there between what ended up happening to Edward and Wallace and what was happening with Talma and Gloria in this custody trial. Um, I think that there are some really interesting parallels with the role that uh, the media and journalism played in, in breaking both of those stories. I was uh, completely oblivious uh, to the existence of Telma and and how um, intricate uh, this plot is has was woven uh, that um, that there was another woman before Wallace, obviously, but the Vanderbilt connection um, when when you first were intrigued by this uh, storyline, uh, you know, by Madonna and and her film, um, how did you start to to dig for? for who this person was, who was Telma and, 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 and then, you know, did the Vanderbilt connection come later? Because there's kind of this, this big international intrigue with names that we know. And you're like, Oh, I never knew there was a connection between here and here. And the world gets, gets awfully small all of a sudden when you see these connections. Um, what was that act of discovery like for you? Uh, well, I started with that, you know, the ubiquitous search medium of today, Wikipedia. Um, I went on Wikipedia and I found, you know, I they referenced the fact that she was involved in the matter of Vanderbilt, but it's very much, that page is very much about her um, involvement with Edward, more so than anything. And so for me, that relationship with Edward was really the kernel, like that was the heart of the story for me at the beginning. And I thought it was going to be a royal romance. I thought it was going to be a book about this woman who um, leaves Edward in the hands of her friend because she's bored of him. That was that was generally what I thought her story was going to be. I thought that I'd find out that she was sick of Edward. And when she left, she was giving Wallace implicit permission to remain behind and pursue Edward for herself. And thankfully, Talma and Gloria wrote a joint autobiography. And in that autobiography, I, I learned that that really wasn't the case. Um, Talma was genuinely in love with Edward, and she left Edward in Wallace's care in a very genuine way, or with a very genuine trust. And so, you know, looping in the Vanderbilt, I didn't think that that was going to become as big of a as big a part of the storyline as I did, um, or as it ended up becoming. But the reason it became as big of a storyline as it did is um, because of a certain reveal that happens later on in the book involving a lawyer that was sent over by Nadeja Milford Haven, who had an, an affair with Gloria. Uh, and that was news that came out during the course of the trial. And we find out, I, I found out during the course of the research that Edward's um, involvement in the trial kind of, or Edward's, Edward's relationship with Talma bleeded, bled into the trial. 
And that, that to me was so interesting that here was this connection. Here's, you know, British royalty and American royalty, um, you know, shall we say. And these two stories, these two dramas are taking place on opposite sides of the Atlantic, but Telma was the woman at the center of both of them. So how did Telma become involved with Edward? How did they meet? And, you know, it, it's not everybody who can just meet a prince and, and <laughs> you know, b- become connected with the royal family. How, how did this happen? So Talma was married to Marmaduke Furness, who was, he was a Viscount, so part of the British aristocracy, and he uh, was one of the wealthiest men in Britain. And Talma met uh, the prince initially at a ball given by Lady Londonderry in London, and she danced with him. And that was something, like Edward was this, he was renowned for dancing. Everybody knew he was the best dancer in, you know, in the United Kingdom. And so it was this kind of mark of honor to dance with the Prince of Wales. I mean, there's even the song about it. I know a girl, um, you know, I know a guy guy who knows a girl who danced with the Prince of Wales. Um, There's that whole song. And so um, initially she had a dance with him and then that was it. They didn't see each other for for quite some time. But then uh, Duke Furness started um, cheating on, on Telma. He started having affairs. And in Britain at the time, in that particular upper echelon of society, it was understood that affairs happen. And that, you know, of course he'll come back, but he's going to have his dalliances and that's all fine and good. And for Talma, who didn't grow up in that echelon of society in that in that particular context, she wasn't prepared for that. She wasn't prepared to just sit around and wait for him to come back. So when she bumped into the Prince of Wales again at a um, farm show in Leicestershire. She, um, you know, he invited her for dinner and she accepted. Uh, Edward was notorious for uh, having affairs with married women. I think that he felt that they weren't going to ask as much from him. There was never going to be the expectation of him marrying them. They were kind of safer. So he entered in, uh, in this relationship with Tama thinking this is, you know, this is a safe bet. And Tama, I think, thought the same thing that that was one thing i was thinking is like what what was edward's fascination with other people's wives this this is a recurring theme with him (laughs) it is a recurring theme and honestly i think it's because you know an unmarried girl an unmarried woman would think you know oh gosh i could become the queen i could become the you know i could become his wife whereas a married woman would say well there's no chance and, you know, you've got to keep in mind that as the Prince of Wales, Edward, it, Edward was the future um, head of uh, head of the Church of England, as well as king. And the Church of England didn't recognize divorce at the time. So being involved with a married woman, it would be quite clear that that would not there would be no expectations of marriage. There'd be no expectations of um, of favor once that relationship ended. You said earlier that, you know, Wallace Simpson has gone down uh, in history as this woman um, that, uh, you know, was was looking was looked upon with scorn uh, probably in the beginning, um, but earned a lot of people's respect. And and like you said, it their story became um, kind of one of the the all time great love stories. You know, he, he gave up a throne for her so that they could mm-hmm. be happy together. You know, that that says a lot. Um, what was, what was her, what was Wallace's relationship with Telma like after, um, the, the, the turnover, if you will. And, uh, and Telma is, finds herself replaced, um, by Wallace. What did that do to their ongoing relationship? It ended it. It effectively ended it. Um, Wallace was, you know, She's such a complicated character because I think she got what she wanted and then she got what she deserved, which was not a happy life. Um, When she first got together with Edward, she kind of purged Edward's other women, other relationships from the historical record. So Frida Dudley Ward, who very famously was involved with Edward for a long period of time and was one of the other women that Edward truly, truly loved, first as a romantic interest and then as a trusted friend. Um, once Wallace came into his life, her calls were never put through again. Uh, Telma, same thing. She was basically cast out and never saw either of them again. Um, 
and and I think Wallace was trying to kind of protect her claim, protect her stake. But Wallace too went into that relationship thinking it was going to end. She never expected to be to become Edward's wife. Um, I don't think she ever wanted to become Edward's wife. Uh, some letters came out um, just a few years ago. I think Anne Saba, um, who I mentioned earlier, one of Wallace's biographers, found them in in which later in life, Wallace is writing to her second husband, Ernest Simpson, saying, I wish none of this had happened. I never wanted it to end this way. So I think Wallace kind of got roped into marriage to a man that she wasn't expecting to marry, that she didn't really want to marry. But because he gave up his crown for her, it's kind of transformed into this greatest love story of all time, because how could it be otherwise? That's fascinating. Um, as you start digging into the story and these characters, um, how we, uh, where all research begins nowadays with Wikipedia, like you mentioned, um, mm-hmm. how do you how did you start digging a little deeper uh, into this? And what were some of the research uh, sources that you um, got to dig into? So I was incredibly lucky because I was writing about people who are very well known uh, and have a lot of, you know, there are a lot of resources built around them, Edward and Wallace in particular. Uh, We've got their letters, we've got their memoirs, but Wallace and Telma, or sorry, Telma and Gloria wrote a a joint autobiography themselves, which was a great source of information to me. And there was a book written in the 1970s by a woman named Barbara Goldsmith, where she details the trial. And she actually was able to get the court transcripts opened in order to write that book, which was huge because I tried to get the court transcripts open for the Vanderbilt trial and I couldn't. Um, But that became a huge resource for me. Um, Other than that, I I was really lucky. As I said, I I wrote part of this book while I was living in Scotland. And as a result, I was able to go down to London and to many of the places where Talma lived and where Talma spent time. And so that gave me kind of that on the ground insight into where she was and what she would have been seeing and what she would have been doing. Uh, for me, I'm a very ta- like I'm, I'm a very tactile person. I like to be able to see the clothes and smell, you know, the perfumes and, and really get into a time period through the objects that I find. So I was able to do quite a lot of that as well um, in the UK. Um, what else? I actually found uh, I was able to uh, visit Edward's biplane in a museum in Gatineau, Quebec, they've got, uh, they've got one of his biplanes. Um, it's a tiger moth, I believe from 1936. So just a little later than, uh, the period that I'm writing about, but Edward was the first British King to have, uh, his pilot's license and wow. flying was a big part of his life. And so I had this scene that I was going to write in the book about him taking Telma up flying, which ultimately didn't make it into the novel, but Going and seeing that plane was such an insight into his character for me because it's this unbelievably gorgeous, it's a little navy and chrome plane with an open cockpit for the pilot and a an enclosed cabin for the passengers. And the enclosed cabin is beautiful. It's this sort of like mahogany red leather interior with just gorgeous detailing. And one of the things it has is on one of the wings of the biplane, it's got a, um, it's got a generator. And the idea for the generator was he wanted to have a radio that he could listen to while he was flying because he was a modern king. He was going to be a modern king. He wanted to be up to date on all the information, Um, which, you know, I saw that and I thought, wow, that's really that's really interesting. What a cool modern thing to do. I ended up going in a, up in a plane of a similar vintage. Uh, that plane was having its um, it was having all of the electro, uh, electrics dealt with. Uh, So I wasn't able to go up in that one, but I went up in one of a similar vintage. And I've got to tell you, even with headphones on, it was so loud in the plane. (laughs) There would have been no way for him to have really been able to hear what was coming across on the wireless radio. But that just that just sums up who Edward was. He was all about the flash. He was all about the image that he was projecting and, and so little about the substance. So that was something that really informed his character. When when writing um, an historical fiction uh, novel, there are there are certain um, elements that are known and are solidified, and you you have no wiggle room with that because that that's a known fact. 
Um, where where historical fiction really shines for me is how the author can take the in between moments and flesh those out so that it links these things that we do know in a in a way that's extremely plausible. Um, I would think that if you were um, uh, dealing with like uh, Henry the Eighth, um, who we mentioned earlier, um, there there's lots of room to be filled in there like the the Tudors TV show um if you if you watch that there's there's lots of embellishment to be done there um but with with uh with Edward and Wallace and and Telma this is more of a modern era uh, story um so how do you how do you stay true to the actual events and look for those places where you can embellish and maybe you feel like you can tie these events together you know there's a certain amount of alchemy involved in that i think um it's for for me the historical the re- historical record had to come first that was really important to me to be as true to the historical record as i could possibly be up to and until it impacted the plot and you know for example um the events of the book the Telma's relationship with Edward and the um, custody trial, those things actually happened about six months apart. But for the purpose of the plot, for the purpose of, um, you know, keeping a tight story and and a compelling story, I I condensed those two timelines um, just a little bit. And I feel like that was not a, I, I, I don't feel like I was being untrue to the characters and untrue to their experiences to, to kind of make that change. Um, as I said, these characters kept mem- diaries, they had wrote memoirs. And so through those resources, I was able to get a sense of what their motivations were. But I mean, even if I was reading someone's diary today, someone's memoir today, you have to take things with a grain of salt. Um, anybody who's writing a memoir is writing it for posterity. They're writing it to come across in the best possible light. And so finding those moments where one person's account of an event didn't add up to another person's account of an event those were really interesting places to be able to to kind of play and to look at okay well what is the plausible motivation here what is the plausible outcome there um as i said these were really interesting people and i i'm not i didn't write this book trying to make out anybody to be a hero or a villain i wrote this book about human beings and human beings are never infallible i think it would have been disingenuous to write the book with telma as absolutely the wronged woman at all times and she was a saint otherwise um let the same thing goes for gloria um so i think that it's really important to be able to look at these characters and re- not reduce them but bring them back down to the level of human beings and look at what their motivations are as human beings not as historical figures the book is called the woman before wallace and it's available everywhere now we're going to put links in the show notes to uh, where you can grab this book in hardcover or audiobook or Kindle edition, uh, however you like to consume books, it's available now. Um, Bryn, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you're doing, uh, where can they find you online? Uh, so you can find me on my website, BrynTurnbull.com. Uh, I'm also on Instagram at BrynTurnbullWrite, Facebook, BrynTurnbullAuthor, and Twitter at BrynTurnbull. We'll put links to all those to make it easy for people to find you. Uh, Bryn, I love the book, and I I, I love your story behind it. Uh, Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you so much. It's been so lovely talking to you.